Welcome, everybody, to the Cone of Shame Better Name Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Work. Guys, I got a fun episode today. I am interviewing Dr. Peter Weinstein and soon to be Dr. Brooke Weinstein. Uh, Peter is Brooke's father, and we are talking about generational differences in veterinary medicine. Basically, where are we going and how do we feel about the future? And uh, should we be comfortable with our kids? going to veterinary school and coming into this profession uh, should we be more than comfortable peter and i and brooke all talk about uh where education is today and where it's going for veterinarians we talk about what the future of the profession looks like there is really good conversation here about uh the is the future of recession are we looking right down the barrel of the next recession and what does that look like what's that going to do to the salaries that we're seeing for uh for veterinarians and for support staff and is it going to change the way that we practice is it going to change pet owners ability to pay for our services and how do we adapt to that how do we keep that medicine accessible wide-ranging uh, conversation topics. Really fun episode. Guys, I hope you will enjoy it. I'm going to stop here and say thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This episode is ad-free thanks to the support of my friends at Care Credit. Guys, let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Peter Weinstein and soon to be Dr. Brooke Weinstein. How are you guys doing? Great, Andy. Good to see you. Or Dr. Rourke. <laughs> you call me Andy, please. Uh, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's do first names. Uh, let's all do first names. Uh, so Peter and Brooke and Andy, and that's what we'll go with this, this time. Brooke, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, have a sun break from midterm. So thanks for inviting me on your podcast. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for uh, thanks for making time, guys. I uh, I want to have you guys on the podcast and talk a little bit about uh, generational differences in vet medicine. And honestly, uh, I I'm thinking a lot about the future of vet medicine and what it looks like as it's changing because we're going through a rapid period of change. And then also, I'm kind of looking at the future of vet medicine. And I have a daughter. She's 14. And uh, she is, she has decided that she wants to be a veterinarian. And I'm going to be honest and say, I have some mixed emotions about that. And I want to talk with you guys a little bit about sort of your experiences and perspectives on what the future kind of looks like and what, uh, yeah, and sort of your experience as Brooke has gone through her training and, um, and just, just generally overall your perspective on, on, on life in the profession and, and that sort of evolution as well. Is that okay? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, cool. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, let's do some some quick bios. Uh, Peter, I've known you for a long, long time. Uh, you have been a mentor of mine since I, I blew my own mind this morning. I woke up this morning for whatever reason. And I, 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 I'll be honest, I had school dreams last night. And I wonder, do you guys have, I'm sure Brooke does, the exams, you know, exams coming and I forgot I had a class. I 100% had those dreams last night. And I, I, I had exams coming up and um, I woke up and thought, oh my God, I'm not in school anymore. And, and then I thought, I graduated in 2008 and then I did some math and I'm like, that's 14 years ago, which blows my own mind. But, um, but yeah, I, it's, it's been a minute since I was in school. Peter Weinstein, do you ever have uh, dreams of, of exams or classes that you forgot? Uh, no, it's funny when you had school dreams, all I could remember was the dream of showing up to school naked when you were a kid and, and, uh, having to go, you never had that dream. Oh, no, I did. Yeah, I totally did. Yeah. I, I still have those dreams. That's, that's funny. <laughs> Brooke, do you, uh, do you wake up having uh panic dreams about your exams? Um, not often. If I do, it's like, I completely did not make it to the test. Um, and yeah. like everything from my car ride, from leaving home to class, like everything went wrong and I just like didn't make it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You you guys are much more balanced than me. All right. Back on, back on topic. Peter, uh, I've known you since vet school. You've been a mentor of mine for a long, long time. Uh, you gave me some of the first advice that I ever got on being a presenter and speaker. And I said to you, um, hey, how, how do you get to, to do more presenting and speaking? And you said you need to write more. 
And I still remember you telling me that. And we were on a bus at the AVMA convention. And I was like, huh, that sounds like good advice. And it is advice that I still remember you giving to me today. And it turned out to be pretty good. It, it's worked out pretty well for me. So, uh, so thank you for that. You are also the author of the E-Myth Veterinarian. You have been the president of the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association. I'm just going off the top of my head right now. I don't have anything written down. Uh, what uh, what else? Uh, you are uh, uh, the owner of Paw Consulting. What, what else am I missing or forgetting in your bio? Uh, you know, Andy, I have known you since you were Brooks' age. Oh, yeah. Before. When you were president of the VBMA yeah. at University of Florida, that's when we first connected. And yeah. So um, this is almost like deja vu. No, yeah. I, I mean, for the past, I, I just got, got done teaching my first year of uh, the business and finance class at Western University. So I'm giving back to the students by teaching at uh, the vet school here in Los Angeles. Um, I, I, you know, I've done a whole bunch of different things within the profession, but now as I head into the twilight years, um, it's really more focused on education um, and growing the profession and, and really disrupting it and, and creating a, a better future for um, Brooke and others because I feel like I have an investment that will be um, maturing in about a year and, and a month. And uh, I'm hoping to get a very good return on my investment. But it's not just Brooke. It's, it's 4,000 other veterinary students that are graduating this year, next year, and all the years down the road. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I appreciate, well, I, I know students appreciate a be, you being involved. And like I said, you've been a mentor for me. And, and there's, uh, it's funny, before we even started recording, I was talking to you about, about my business and things that I'm doing and being like, hey, Peter, how do you look at this? Because you wrote the E-Myth Veterinarian and, uh, and you always have a, uh, excellent insight to give. Brooke, you are in your third year at Oregon State, is that correct? Yeah, I have about a month left of my third year. Oh yeah, and so have you started clinical rotations yet? No, I get to start June 11th. All right, so coming up very very when people when people hear this, you will be in your rotations. Cool. All right. So very exactly right. It's been a long it's been a long time coming. All right. Brooke, when did you decide that you wanted to go to vet school? Did you know from a, a really young age or is it something you came to later uh, sort of in your education? I've got, I've been asked this question a lot and I really can't pinpoint anything. Um, I feel like it was like junior or senior year of high school when I kind of had to start thinking about college. And I think it was just something I knew about. And so my dad kind of shoved me into a hospital, obviously not his because he didn't have one. And it was like, well, if you can survive surgery and you're still standing then mm -hmm. maybe it'll work and so then yeah I survived that and I was like might as well see if I like this and yeah kind of applied to colleges with like veterinary school in mind and I stuck with it so yeah I, Peter were you excited about that from the beginning when your daughter was was you know going into college and starting to talk about pre-vet what, what was your what was your emotional experience at that time Woo! <laughs> you, you, so you were fired up I was fired up I, I really was because I had sold my practice when when Brooke was like three or four or five or something like that and so she really wasn't raised in a stainless steel cage like most baby veterinarian yeah. most veterinarians babies are yeah and so when um, Brooke was showed interest in becoming a veterinarian and um, I think some of it was some of it was nature, some of it was nurture, and she um, she would go to uh, the zoo with my wife and, and help out at the zoo as well. So I think she had some different exposures that maybe uh, pushed her to that level. But when, you know, I didn't, when Brooke said she wanted to become a, a veterinarian, all I said is, Brooke, I'll do whatever you want to do to help, but I'm not going to, I didn't, I don't feel that I formally pushed her one way or the other, except to open doors and give her opportunities. Yeah. I, I think that that there's a difference in saying I'll be supportive versus, Hey, I'm sort of driving the bus. Brooke, did you feel pressured to go towards vet medicine because your dad was so involved in it? No, I don't think he made a single decision for me besides me just asking him, where do I go? And then he was like, here's this <laughs> in clinic. State. Go there. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, no vet school wise. He was like, 
wherever wherever you get in. <laughs> <laughs> but Peter, did you ever rethink that emotional uh, response? Was there ever a time when when you have thought in you know in the last eight years uh, when you have thought, hmm, maybe maybe this isn't uh, the best place for my child to go? Absolutely not. No, I, you were, so you were I, I, hardcore. No. No, I, I was I was very much supportive. If, if I'm going to have the roles that I've had in the profession as an advocate, as an educator, even as a disruptor, then it would be it would be wrong for me to have any second guessings from that standpoint. I really have to feel that that being an advocate for the profession as I am, that being an advocate for what my daughter wants is the right thing as well. That's interesting. I don't know if I am sold on that. And here's why. So uh, you and I both love vet medicine and we worked hard on it. Um, I, there's definitely things about vet medicine that I look at and I go, I don't know about this or where does that go? And so it's funny that you say, no, as an advocate, you know, I, I'm sort of all in. I go, as an advocate, I, I still have, have questions and things, um, you know, and, and, I, and again, like I said, I, I'm honestly wrestling with these things at, looking at my own kids, you know, for example, you know, the, the change in practice ownership in our profession. And we've got, you know, corporization and things like that. I, my, where I came from is a little bit different in that I, I thought that I was going to be a physician for most of my life because my, my dad was a small time, a small town surgeon. And that's kind of where I wanted to go. And I, I had the experience. I got to be about my junior year in college. And my dad, I was talking to him and I was getting ready to take the MCAT. And he said to me, he was like, you know, son, I'm not sure I would do this if I was we're, you know, starting over now. And this is about human medicine. And man, that was, I was kind of strung, thunderstruck by that. And so I ended up not going to med school and I have never regretted not going to medical school like that, I, you know, but it was still that jarring thing at the time. And so I've had that experience of, of having this idea of, of something that, that I thought was great and then had it sort of, you know, rocked and then going, wow, well, this has fundamentally changed. Um, and so I, I kind of went through that. So I look at that medicine and I'm still, I'm still very positive and optimistic, but it, it has radically changed in the last 10 years and I see it continuing to change. And so I don't know, like um, when, when we look at things like um, when we gaze into our crystal ball and think about what the life of a veterinarian is going to look like in 20 years, uh, do you think that that looks significantly different from what it looks like now? You know, I probably would throw that on Brooke. Yeah. Where does, she, where does she see her job and her future? I mean, she knows that I'm a workaholic, but, um, you know, I, I think it'd be interesting to see what Brooke thinks about her future and the future of the profession. I do think it will be different. Um, like, as I guess, as a third year going into fourth year, people are starting to think, or a lot of my classmates are starting to think about, like, where are they going to work? Are they going to go corporate? Are they going to go private? how many practices they're looking at that they think are private, but are actually corporate. Um, and just, I think the increasing amount of corporate practices is going to just change the profession and like how veterinarians or how, like what your job as a veterinarian is going to be. Cause people will have the opportunities to work like three or four day weeks instead of the five day weeks for 12 hours a day. <laughs> um, I think the work-life balance will get better. I also see the push towards like referring and specialty practices over just the GPs doing everything. Um, kind of how human medicine is a little bit, I guess. Um, so I think that's going to continue to go that way is what it looks like, at least from where I am. Yeah. So are, are you considering specialty, specialization, doing a residency, things like that? Or are you still interested in being a GP, given that you s perceive a shift in that direction? Um, at this point, I don't want to do more school. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I get that. But yeah, I, I'm also at the point where I have no idea what I want to do right now. <laughs> gotcha. Understand. Okay. So so talking about this, so you sort of mentioned work-life balance as something that you see coming in the future in vet medicine. And I, I do agree. I think that that's been a huge move from where we have been in the past and a big cultural shift. Brooke, when you start to look at the priorities that you have 
uh, as a third year vet student. And then also the priorities that your classmates have. Rank out for, for me, what do you think people care the most about? I think a lot of people say, what do young doctors want or what do people coming out of vet school want? in their career or what are they what are they looking for in a practice and i know you know with a very competitive hiring environment a lot of people kind of want to know that so you you mentioned the hours and work life balance off, off the top what do you think are the main drivers for you and your and your classmates as you start to think about where you're going to go next and what jobs you would take um well i think after vet school a lot of my classmates just want some time to breathe um <laughs> <laughs> so i I feel like I've heard a lot of people looking for like a four day work week, like the longer hours, but less days of working. Um, yeah. Like the four tens. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like at least with like the people that I talk to the most, I haven't, we haven't talked about what we want from our jobs. Um, I think we're just kind of so excited to start fourth year that I haven't even thought about after that. <laughs> Oh, really? So, so that was sort of a question I was kind of leading up to. Do you feel, because I've, I've sort of heard rumors that vet students seem to be making employment decisions earlier and earlier in their school time than they did in the past. That's always just kind of been a rumor, and I've never really been able to pin that down. Is that your impression that, that you think that people are making decisions about where they're going to go? Like they're taking, are they taking jobs in their second year and in their third year that, in the way that I hear, or is that fairly uncommon? I've heard the rumors. I know like very few people who have, um, I wouldn't say the majority or like even half of the class is like that. Um, I think I only specifically know one person who like has considered or has interviewed for a job in her third year. So mm. I, I maybe it's different at other schools or maybe that's just not the, I just don't know who they are. Interesting. I oh, know that yeah. that's, that's that's what when I talk to vet students, I, I kind of get a similar answer of I, I haven't met a lot of vet students who actually are seeing that trend. But I I do hear a lot of sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, excited whispers. Peter, uh, you you're teaching at Western. I mean, do you have a similar perspective? Do you think the timing of people taking jobs is changing? We actually talked about this yesterday It was the final class of the year. And uh, I just had what I call AMA. Ask me anything. Yeah. Um, and uh we talked about, you know, I suggested that they're a year from graduating and that they should be looking now. And, and I would suggest there's probably five to eight people in the class of 105 that have probably got jo hard, hard job offers already, contracts. Yeah. Um, we started talking about the economy as well, because there's a, this threat of a recession in the next 12 months and yeah. what impact that might have on the business of veterinary medicine and some of these highly inflated salaries, maybe I shouldn't say highly inflated salaries, some of the growth in salaries over the past uh, two years and what, re what impact the recession may have. So I, I don't think it's too early now to be looking for a position a year from now. And especially if we look at economics 101 that says supply and demand, right now there's a huge demand and a small supply. Yeah. So if you can find some place that you want to work in a location that you want to work that gives you life balance and mentoring and all of those other key keywords, take it now, get the contract, get it signed, sealed and delivered, get a signing bonus or whatever you can from that standpoint and spend the entire of your senior year learning and not worrying. Yeah. So where are you when you look into your crystal ball on the finances in the next 12 to 16 months. And what I mean when I say that is, you know, we're seeing uh, rising staff salaries, we're seeing rising doctor salaries, we're seeing quote unquote signing bonuses, which are actually retention bonuses for the most part to encourage people to, to stay on for, uh, for multiple years. If there is a recession, right? We're seeing we're seeing rising inflation is the number one thing that people are upset about. Um, you know, we're hearing the Fed talk about the economy running hot and taking active steps to to clamp that back down. If we move in a recessionary direction, are you of the mindset that that medicine is a recession resistant industry and demand for doctors is so high because supply is so low that veterinarians will be fairly insulated from that? Or do you think that there's a recession coming and we have um, we have a lot of exposure because of the private equity and the high multiples that people are paying and the, the upward trend in salaries where we're going to see a significant pullback in the money being spent in, in medicine? 
where where are you in that in between those two kind of uh, think of it as a spectrum so dr rourke andy when you were a baby doctor between 2008 and 2012 we had the great recession yeah now depending upon where you were in the country there was a shortage of jobs an overabundance of relief doctors and some tremendous anxiety on the case of general practitioners and their ability to pay their bills pay their staff we had doctors getting laid off etc um, i don't think we're going to get to that point in, mm -hmm. in the current situation and i think a lot of the escalation of salaries has been a response to the inability to find doctors for positions, especially at the corporate level, because they have an investment in a business that without doctors, yeah, no business. Right. And so they have, um, they've used money as a retention as opposed to culture. Yeah. And so I, I think what we're going to start to see, and, and, and if you look at the trends economically in the profession right now, transactions are down. I mean, same period last year, we're not seeing nearly as many people. Revenue is up about 4%, which is essentially fee increases. So we're, we're busy because of our inefficiencies as a profession, but we're not busy because people are, we're not busy because we, um, we have a shortage of, of doctors. We're busy because of the inefficient business model, the failure to leverage our staff, the failure to pay and keep our staff, and, and high turnover. There's so many variables from that standpoint that we don't have time to get into today. But what I do anticipate is we're going to start to see a flattening out. I, I think what we we had a perfect storm economically during the first two years of the pandemic where people had money. They weren't going anywhere. They weren't right. spending money on travel and, and big screen TVs. They were sitting next to their pet and the pet, the, the pet had a hiccup and they thought it had brain cancer. And so they would bring it in and have it seen and they would spend money because they actually had liquid income. But I think as we see this, this great retirement or whatever it's being called resignation, mm -hmm. and uh, we see less money being pumped into the uh, people by the government, I think that spending is going to slow down. Yeah. I think that's it. I think travel has increased and everything else, especially if you've been on an airplane, as I know you have. So I, I think what we're going to start to see is a normalization, getting back to where we were to a degree in 2019, 2020. Um, but then it's going to be how do we deliver veterinary medicine at that point in time? Um, and, and what's it going to look like in terms of increasing our efficiency levels? So bottom line is, I think we're going to see a normalization and I think we're going to see a flattening out, but I think we're not going to see salaries drop. I just think we're going to, we're going to see a slowdown in the growth of those salaries from that standpoint. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Let's talk about, let's talk about the impact of, of recessionary forces on pet owners and on spending. Cause I, I think, I think that, that you point that out rather astutely. Are we going to see pet owners pulling back in their spending on pets? And if so, are we set up to deal with, um, with more cash strapped clients than we have been in the past? What does that look like? It, you know, it's a great question because I think what we're starting to see is, is almost a haves and have not economy. Yeah. I, I, I hate I, it, but I think you're right. I think what, you know, I, I, I asked at a couple of the meetings where I was speaking at in the last 12 months, how many of you used fee increases to, as a barrier to access to care to slow down the funnel of people coming in 30 to 35 percent of the room said, yeah, we raised our fees with the hope mm -hmm. that it would slow down people coming in. And the next question is, well, what did it? The answer was no. Right. So now we have these these fees that are up there, but we have people who don't have the cash flow to make it happen. So I, I think what we're going to start to see is, is, as happened in 2008 to 2012, delays of people coming in. So now they come in at a more critical stage. Pets ending up in the shelters because people couldn't afford what they invested in. Um, and I think we're going we're gonna to have to look at some sort of normalization of fee schedules because um, we have really started to create a rift between what people can afford and um, what we're charging. And so some of the communities that we do some work with in LA where people can't afford veterinary care, it's going to become even harder for them 
to be able to access veterinary care. And so we've got to start to look at some of these spectrums of care and, and all sorts of different things that we've talked about to make veterinary services um, accessible because I don't think we're underpaid and I don't think we're um, undercharging. I think we just haven't created that whole value proposition for the client experience that, that people put a value on what we do yet. Brooke, do you feel like vet students are getting some, or at least in your experience at Oregon State, do you feel like there's part of the curriculum that's that's focusing on talking to clients about money or accessibility to care? Is that something that's kind of front and center in training today, or is it something that's kind of put off uh, until after, you know, and until after we get the medicine learned? <laughs> yeah, I well, we have one business course um, that I think <laughs> maybe only my dad or maybe a few speakers did talk about finances and like people's ability to pay, but otherwise, no, it's mostly just, <laughs> just the medicine. Yeah. I, I get that. You know, like there's, you should always, you should always learn how to do the medicine first. It's just, it's just one of those things where I, uh, it, I guess and this is a passion point of mine as well is, you know, how do we, how do we communicate with pet owners and just sort of meet them, meet them where they are. I feel like there's, there's sort of growing, interest and emphasis there but it's still you know there's so much to fit into a curriculum but i, I still i don't know i i would i'd personally like to see more education in in those type of hard conversations just because i think that they're coming well i think uh you know brooke worked with me in la at some of the clinics and has been running clinics for underserved communities in um in oregon and i i think when you start to do that you see how important pets are in people's lives and how eager they are to take care of them but they also have to feed their kids and put shoes on their sure. themselves. So I think part of the curriculum really does need to be uh, enhanced understanding of the entire population. They don't need to take a course in economics. They right. need to take a course in understanding people and pets and communication and the human animal bond. And, and I think that's why, you know, Brooke has been involved with the shelter medicine club and I don't mean to put words in Brooke's mouth, but um, <laughs> I mean, I could continue this if you want. Um, yeah, sure. I guess, yeah, I, guess I kind of have a little bit different experience than probably a lot of people in my class. I also, um, last term, I worked at a wellness clinic that only gave like vaccines, dewormers, uh, preventatives and stuff. And a lot of people were coming in either because they couldn't get an appointment at their primary veterinarian or they're, they're just like the prices keep going up and they're like, I can't afford that. Mm. Um, so I also, I guess, going back to like, where where's vet med going to be in 10 years? Yeah. Um, these pop-ups of wellness clinics, I think, are also going to change why people go to general practitioners. Because um, I see a lot of people going to wellness clinics for their vaccines and preventatives to get them at lower cost. But then yeah. but then they um, the wellness clinics can't provide any more care than that. So then they'll start going to their GPs for when they actually have the ear problems and the eye problems and the skin problems. Um, so that's also been really interesting for me to see because I've never actually seen a wellness clinic before besides the ones that we do for the communities that are for free for yeah. the, um, the low income population, which I've also been a part of. So it's been really interesting seeing all of that from like kind of different levels of income. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, I I'm fond of saying right now, the future is fragmentation, meaning I, I, I think our profession is really going to split apart and you're going to see a practice is doing a lot of different things, filling a lot of different niches. I don't think that there's going to be a uniform model of practice. So, you know, you were talking before that you couldn't be an advocate. I think you have to have, you have to be more of an advocate now. So Andy, we have a broken profession. Okay. Education model, association model, mm -hmm. um, business model. Well, we are, we as doctors want to fix broken things. Yeah. So I think our role, yours and mine, is to identify where things are broken and come up with new solutions, different solutions, unique solutions, um, reconfigured solutions to help um, fix these things for the future. So that's why I'm an advocate because I, it forces me to think differently about how we can create this wellness clinic concept, the CVS clinic concept, that the urgent care concept, and all of these different things that, that retool this profession going forward because we ain't gonna get where we wanna go by doing what we've done in the past. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think um, it's funny uh, for me, the fact that my daughter seems to be serious about, about vet school. Uh, it, I feel pressure to fix problems that I didn't necessarily feel that much pressure to fix in the past. You know, I'm like, oh, this doesn't affect me. I'm going to go on. And now I'm like, oh, crap. Here, here comes Jacqueline. I got to we got we to work on this. Uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of that in my mind. Uh, yeah, but, welcome to my world. Yeah. Oh, totally. So, Brooke, let me ask you this. So, so is there advice that you got from your dad, the veterinary business consultant, uh, business teacher, before you went into vet school that you have found to be very useful that, uh, that other people would wish that they had gotten? Oh, let me see if I can remember <laughs> this. <laughs> I was just curious if there was anything that stuck out uh, in, in your mind of like, yeah, my dad sort of told me this or, 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 or he, he helped me understand this and it served me well. I don't know. Like, I, I don't think I can remember any exact words, but I feel like there were concepts in the words that he was telling me. Kind of just like, watch out for yourself because <laughs> all you're going to know is school. Um, the amount of times he was like, whatever happened in the news between the years that he was in vet school, he didn't get. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I will be prepared to live in a bubble for four years. Um, oh, yeah. But also like cognizant of the fact that I need to look after myself when I can remember. Yeah. Oh, it's funny you say that. I when it, when Peter was talking about the recession from 2008 2012, I'm like, I missed that. I was <laughs> I was head down in my first job, <laughs> you know, like just 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 learning medicine and uh, you know putting one foot in front of the other. But it's funny. I it, uh, I think that there's I think that there's a lot of truth to the idea of just you know putting our heads down and 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 getting done what we needed to get done. I I'm thinking a lot about these days about what do I have control over and what do I not have control over? And I feel like as we look at, if we look at modern media, we are bombarded all day, every day with terrible things and injustices and hardships. And I think that there's a balance of not blowing those things off. Like, you know, it's, it's, I'm not trying to, to ignore the problems in our society or, or not help other people. And at the same time, I also don't think that we can live all day, every day, just immersed in challenges and hardships that we really don't have any control over. You know, um, you just take, for example, some sort of, uh, you know, problems in, in our government. Uh, I know they're hard to find, but I'm sure that they're there. Uh, problems in our government. Uh, I, I get one vote and, you know, and I can be educated about who I vote for. And beyond that, there's not a whole lot that I can do, uh, you know, and, and I sort of have to, to figure out how, how invested in this do I want to be? What is a healthy level of investment versus um, versus uh, just me being upset all the time about things that I can't control? And so I, I think about that a lot with vet medicine too and go, what is in my power and what is not? You know, it, it's uh, it's interesting. I, I, and, I, and I always sort of put this forward to, to a lot of vets and other to practices. I think it's important to be able to step back and look at the profession as a whole but I think it's a lot more useful and probably mentally healthy to be able to dial in and look at where you are and what you need to do and what look at your practice and what your practice can do and, uh, and, and what is available, you know, in that specific context, because those are the things that you can control. But um, anyway, I just been thinking a lot about dialing in and dialing out. And so when we have these sort of conversations about where is the profession going and what can we do for it? I, I always sort of try to file that away in the back of my mind. Well, I think what, I've been most proud of in watching Brooke through the, the first three years is her finding time for herself, yeah. whether it's snowboarding, whether it is working the clinics and, and doing the research, but trying to have a balance in what she does. And I, I think that's something I neglected to do. I neglected to do after I was in practice. I, I don't remember any music from the 80s and early 90s. Um, so I, uh, and, and I think, uh, it, it, and also not getting um, sucked into a lot of the, the news, you know, not mm -hmm. getting inundated with what's going on in the world because the little world is the veterinary school world right now, but you have to get out of that bubble as well. 
And I think if you spend too much time surrounding yourself with your classmates, um, some of those naysayers, those negative people, yeah, have an impact on you as well. So I think finding that balance and and understanding herself and her needs, and watching that is um, very rewarding as a father. Brooke, what is the thing that you are most looking forward to uh, in veterinary medicine as you as you as you move towards graduation? What are you most looking forward to? I think just doing what I went to school for. Just very basic. Um, yeah, we I been telling people this because we've had um junior clinics so we're basically shadowing fourth years um during this term and we've gone from three years of sitting for like 12 hours a day to mm-hmm. going into like standing for like 12 hours a day um and our bodies are kind of hurting just from the four hours of shadowing um <laughs> but yeah i'm just excited to to do what i went to school for yeah that's awesome Peter, so as uh, as a parent of, of a veterinary student, and then also as a as a lecturer and teacher at a veterinary school, what is your number one piece of advice for for people who are entering the profession? Uh, what is the thing that you think will serve uh, will serve them well going forward? I, I think we need to bring fun back into veterinary medicine. Amen. I I think that. Um, we take ourselves too seriously at times, uh, and it makes it for a very stressful work environment. I think we create a lot of our own mental health issues, and I, there are external variables sure. as well. But I, I really do think that that hospital owners need to shut down and take people to the movies or bowling or the improv or just hear Andy Rourke, whatever. Um, and uh, but I do think we need to take back control of ourselves. And, and I think we need to have some fun and we need to make sure that fun is one of our core values. I, I think yeah. we're so focused on uh, other things that we lose track of the fact that we are people too. Yeah. And that if we are not healthy, we can't take care of our clients and our patients. And so if I was going to give a message to my colleagues and if I'm going to give a message to the next generation is, um, yeah, take your job serious, but take life and have some fun with it as well. And make sure you go out and, and uh, engage in the world and uh, be a contributor in the world, but have fun doing so. Well, I, I think I want to take what Peter said and then what Brooke said and kind of put it together, I think, in my mind, because I think you guys are both right on. Uh, I completely agree with putting fun back in what we do. I, I think I think that, that we should we need to find the fun. Um, and just being in practice. And, and I, I think that that's important for our long-term happiness. And to Brooke's point about just being excited about doing the job, you know, I, I think that we get sucked up into the, into this big picture of, of what we're supposed to be and, and, and this great meaning and purpose. And the truth is we should, we should remember to be happy just seeing appointments. We should be, we should be happy just to do vaccines and get to meet a family that's excited about their new kitten and just to, just to find enjoyment in fixing uh, a urinary tract infection or lancing an abscess. Like that stuff is amazing. We get to do that for our job. And, And I think that we have a bad habit. At least I do is you forget that it's awesome. And we stop looking at it as awesome. And we focus on the sort of existential uh, headaches and hardships that we really don't have any control over. And so I, I, anyway, I just wanted to put those things together. I, th- I think that's my big takeaway from, from our discussion here is remember to have, remember to have fun. And the other thing is remember that what we do is awesome and people are excited to, they would love to do what we do. And they think what we do is fascinating. We should remember to enjoy doing it. And when, I'm, when I say re- enjoy doing it, I mean, enjoy doing the small things, enjoy seeing the appointments, doing the easy stuff, you know, fi- fixing the coughing dog. Like we should be proud of that and we should enjoy the process of doing it. Guys, thank you both so much for being here. I really, really appreciate your time. Andy, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's not often that Brooke and I are actually together for 30 to 45 minutes um, and have a chance to talk. So it was, uh, thank you for bringing the family together. It was nice. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me on too. Thanks guys. Thanks everybody. Take care of yourselves. And that's our episode. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, Thanks again to Care Credit for making this podcast possible and free. Gang, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.